Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm talking with Gina Martin-Adams of Bloomberg Intelligence. We'll look at some of the charts that she is focusing on, telling the story of strength in the markets. The S&P, the Nasdaq, continuing to press the high side, pushing to a new swing high. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. I learned a couple years ago from John Murphy that technical analysis was all about quantifying investor behavior. It was recognizing the fact that markets move in trends, that history repeats itself, or as we say, it often rhymes. And by analyzing price, by analyzing charts, we can better understand how investors are voting with their capital, arguably the most important thing we can measure. By analyzing trend and momentum, breadth and sentiment, we can start to quantify that behavior and start to anticipate what may come next based on the different uh, measures that we can uh, that we can bring to bear in the uh, from the technical toolkit. For now, it seems to be that the long side is working. The S&P and the Nasdaq having another strong day pushing to the upside. Materials, though, followed by industrials, the two top sectors. We'll dig into materials a little bit. Look at a name or two uh, filling in that sector. Let's get right to our market recap and look at what happened today and how that relates the short term to the long term. Let's look at the S&P 500 up 0.7%. And actually, before we get there, by the way, I do want to start with a poll we asked you recently. Know your candle patterns. In a downtrend, you have a candle with the open and close around the same level. A long lower shadow, no upper shadow. Which pattern is this? Correct 77% of you. I, I didn't even read this question. Ahead, so as I'm doing it, I'm looking at the answers. Hammer candles, 100% right. And what you need to remember is it's all about uh, the trend, right? So in a downtrend, that's actually called a hammer candle. And think of it, I was always taught a hammer candle, it's like hammering out a bottom. Um, it literally looks like a little hammer uh, when, you, when you use a candle chart. It's a great visual representation of a change in character, right? A trend is going down. All of a sudden, you have a lower trade. And the open, uh, we accelerate down from the open, but by the close, we're right back at the highs. So somewhere along the way, sellers have run out of steam. Buyers have come in. Maybe value-oriented investors are willing to buy in on the weakness for whatever reason. That pattern, and forget what the name is, hammer candle, it doesn't really matter too much to me. What matters to me is what it represents about the short-term sentiment. I'm a big fan of looking for what we call changes of character. The market looks a certain way, and then it looks something different. I think something like a hammer candle can be a great visual way of identifying or anticipating when a downtrend may be exhausted and look for a potential bounce to the upside when you see that candle pop up. All of the candle patterns you may be interested in are all found in our chart school section of our website. So check that out if you're not familiar with everything that I just said. With that in mind, let's go to our market recap. No hammer candle on the S&P or the NASDAQ because they are in confirmed uptrends. And so what we have to remember is 4,300 was the level we were talking about for so long. It's now receding in the rearview mirror as we continue to push higher. And uh, for now, the S&P is just below 43.70. That's up 0.7% from yesterday's close. The NASDAQ composite even more up about 0.8%, around 13.570. Mid caps and small caps all having a decent day as well. And the mid cap S&P 400 actually was the best performer, although all three of them up about a similar amount, just around 1%, a little under that uh, for the course of the day today. The VIX pushing back down. We talked about how the VIX being uh, remaining lower during a steady uptrend is very reminiscent of 2021. A slow and steady uptrend, minimal drawdowns, right? The deepest drawdown we had in 2021 was maybe 3 to 5%, I would say probably at the most, but a lot of just shallow pullbacks as this just persistent uptrend uh, seem to uh, seem to continue on. The FANG stocks at the time were, uh, you know, certain parts of 2021 were some uh, pretty strong areas of the market. And then that change, right? But the consistent uptrend on low volatility is what 2023, particularly in June, is feeling more and more similar to and a stark con contrast to what we saw in 2022, which was obviously a downtrend, but on elevated volatility. 
Looking at interest rates, of course, we have the Fed meeting this week. So tomorrow we'll be talking a lot about uh, the Fed, the decision they make, what the impact may be. Uh, I hope with my guest, Gina Martin-Adams, we'll have some time to talk briefly about what that means for her and how to think about the, uh, the, the Fed meeting this week and what that potential trajectory for Fed rate hikes or uh, no more rate hikes may mean for uh, different sectors and, uh, and, and, and the overall trajectory of the market. For today, the yield curve, for the most part, moving to the upside. The short end, pretty stable from yesterday. Five-year uh, yield above 4% at the end of the day. The 10-year yield, where we tend to focus, is right around 384. Dollar index down about a third of a percent. That's using the UUP, which is a bullish dollar uh, ETF. Over in the commodity space, precious metals lower. So gold down about three quarters of a percent, silver down one and a half percent. The rest of the commodity complex, a little more uh, geared toward energy and uh, soft commodities, uh, for the most part, all in the green. Crude oil prices moving higher today. Energy, not a great day on a relative basis, but not too bad, up about a half a percent. Finally, cryptocurrency. There's been a lot of choppiness in the crypto market. I feel like in general, that's a general way of describing the cryptocurrency space. But particularly recent, recently, as we had a lot of uh, uh, headlines, a lot of headline risk, a lot of regulatory risk coming into play. Big question marks in terms of the stability or maybe the promise of some of these different uh, cryptocurrencies and what the potential may be. For now, Bitcoin and Ethereum, not too much of a change, but there was a lot of movement. Bitcoin actually got up to 26,400, now just below 26,000, and Ether just below 1740 here as we wrap up the uh, equity trading session. Quickly over on the sector side, I mentioned materials having a strong day, up 2.3%. And as you can tell, it wasn't the gold stocks, it was other things, uh, like Steel Dynamics was one of the top performing names in the S&P today. Uh, other names we'll uh, look at as well. Materials industrials were the top two. So materials up 2.3%, industrials 1.1%, consumer discretionary just over 1%. On the bottom of the list, some defensive stuff like utilities, which were essentially flat. Consumer staples up 0.4% and communication services up a third of a percent. So not too far from the bottom. So one of the ratios we've talked about quite a bit is offense versus defense. Looking at consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. Things you want versus things you need. That ratio tends to go up when we are uh, making more discretionary purchases as consumers. And that tends to make that ratio push to the upside. It's more of a, of a bullish sign. A downtrend would be when investors are getting defensive and going more to the relative defense of consumer staples. Today, yet again, further fueling that uptrend in consumer discretionary, outperforming the defensive sector of consumer staples. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P. Just think about what today meant relative to the big picture. So yesterday, right on Friday, we talked about getting up to 4,300. And the end of last week was an attempt to get above 4,300 that failed. Right? We never really pushed above 4,300. The question mark we issued on a Friday show was, will we be able to have enough upside momentum to power through 4,300? I think that question was answered yesterday on Monday session with a nice move to the upside, closing well above 4,300 for the first time really since uh, you know, mid-2022, uh, early spring of 2022. Today, we got that crucial follow-through day, right? And so we often have talked about when a market hits a particular resistance level, it's all about the follow-through. And a lot of, uh, you know, very well-renowned technical analysts like John Murphy, Larry Williams, Tom DeMarc ha all have some sort of rule in their toolkit talking about follow-through days. And they have different names for that, different ways of, of applying it, whether it's looking at a per certain percent move above a threshold or a follow-through day, X number of days moving a, a certain, uh, you know, remaining above a certain resistance level. They all have this concept of follow-through. And that's an important uh, technical concept I'd encourage you to, uh, to focus on because it, it, it minimizes whipsaws or minimizes you getting caught on the wrong side of, uh, of a whipsaw environment. So yesterday with the higher close, today following through to the upside, I would argue that's a good follow through day, confirming that this trend for now is positive. If there's anything to worry about, again, the fact that the market's going up, I don't think is a bad thing at any point. However, you know, what could we be concerned about? I would say looking at charts like AMD, which we'll get to here in a minute, you know, maybe overextended. Certainly, a lot of these are overbought. A lot of the Menomina stocks or the FANG stocks have had pretty incredible runs. The S&P itself is now overbought for the first time since February of, last, uh, of this year. August of last year, of course, those are pretty significant uh, tops. But the fact that it's overbought is not a bad thing. I always say overbought means up a lot. That means the trend has been positive. Get concerned when it's no longer overbought. That's when there can be a bit of a question mark in terms of the sustainability of a rally. For now, hanging in there okay. 
Now, I mentioned the material sector, uh, the top performing sector, not often here in 2023 that that's uh, how I've described uh, the material sector. It's usually not been in that sort of uh, in that sort of case. What's interesting is uh, materials have actually been an underperformer through most of 2022. You can see at the bottom the relative performance of the XLB, the materials ETF versus the S&P 500. You can see the trend has been down up until the end of May. For now, we're seeing that rotate higher. Reminds me of like small caps, the relative performance of small caps, the equal weighted S&P, the relative performance has rotated higher a little bit. These are all signs of a potential change of character. I think what's interesting on the chart of the XLB, we're breaking above a trend line from the last couple significant highs. We now have a bit of a double bottom, the March and May lows lining up right around $75 for the XLB. We're now bouncing off of that level. Do we get above the most recent swing high around 82? That would be something I would be looking for on uh, this one in particular. Now, there are a lot of names we can look at. We'll bring up a steel name. This is STLD, uh, Steel Dynamics. You know, I think it's worth noting, uh, we often bring up Fibonacci retracements just as a way of, you know, thinking about the overall uh, structure of the market, right? Once we've had a big move, what's sort of that overall structure? So if you take the low from January of 2022 on STLD, you take the high from March of this year, Look at how we pulled back to the 38.2% retracement level. It's right around 102, 103. We bounced off of there in March and in April. We finally broke through there at the beginning of May. We now came down to the 50% level. And now we're rallying off there. With Fibonacci retracements, it is technically level. These other two are a little more common, but a lot of other technical disciplines um, – like GAN comes to mind, uh, had the 50% level as a very important level. And you can see that that's actually been uh, a pretty good, uh, a pretty good uh, support level for now. So we've bounced off of this, uh, this low around 91, now back above both, both moving average. That's an encouraging sign. Staying above the 50-day after this sort of rally can often be a great way of differentiating uh, the top performers from the struggling performers. Just to finish off, and then we're going to take a brief uh, break, Alta Beauty. You have a number of names in the top 10 list that are coming off of fairly weak levels. Comerica, CMA is another one in the financial sector, obviously struggling quite a bit, but starting to rally here in the last, uh, in the last week or two. Alta is coming off of a, of a recent low, right? We had the gap lower, and then we sort of pushed lower. We became oversold. What tells you that a trend like this is starting to change? I would argue something like RSI is often a leading indicator. When it becomes oversold, that tells you that the conditions are really bad. The price is weak. Look for it to come out of that oversold region. That's what happened a couple days ago. And what that tells you is we're starting to see buyers come in and buy in on the weakness of the price. So today, while a nice gap higher, a nice move to the upside, I think that's just the latest evolution of this bottoming pattern. The PPO is another indicator we can put on the bottom. You look for a beat down uh, oversold name that starts to rotate higher. We just got a buy signal today from that indicator. So Alta potentially the beginning of more of a broader recovery. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Gina Martin Adams of Bloomberg. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. I'm Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's such a pleasure to put this show on for you. We have a lot of really good plans for the studio and for Stock Charts TV here in the coming months. Excited to share a lot, with, a lot of it with you here very, very soon. Before we get to today's guest, Gina Martin-Adams, I want to remind you, we have a mailbag segment a couple times a week, and those questions come from people like you. What questions are coming up as you are analyzing the charts on your Stock Charts login? Let us know via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter. Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. And if you're watching us on YouTube, just put a question below the video you're watching there on our Stock Charts TV channel. We'd love to hear from you and hope to answer your question live on the air on Friday's show of this week. I want to welcome on today's guest, Gina Martin Adams. Gina is the chief equity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence, coming to us from New York, hopefully recovering from the smoky conditions here. I feel like the weather is clearing, the markets are showing some optimism. How are you, Gina? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me, Dave. And yes, we're moving into summer with a nice breakout. Congrats. And it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, Gene. I've, I've known you and followed your work for quite some time. Excited to share some of your thoughts with, uh, with our viewers. We're starting with your chart of the S&P 500. Undeniably, we're seeing strength in the markets. What does the trend in the markets recently mean to you? How would you characterize it? You know, I think that we've just been accumulating strength really since the lows reached late last fall in the September and October correction. We detected a major low in some of our sentiment models, which we'll talk about later on in the in the 10 minutes we have together. But importantly, we broke above the long term downtrend channel that had really formed with the bear market of 2022 with the spring. Then with the bank's crisis as of March, we retested that channel. 
That allowed us to create a new uptrend line, which we've managed to stay above. I think many people were looking at that range that had evolved through January, February, March. That range was very frustrating for many, but what we detected in the breadth indicators that we follow, as well as the uh, MACD indicator, was a bit of a pennant cr created through that range trade in the broader market. Pennants, of course, only occur in the midst of cons the consolidation patterns in the market. And because of our sentiment indicators, which suggested October was that major low, our prevailing assumption was going into summer, we'd see a breakout. And here we are with the market finally breaking out momentum and uh, MACD confirming the breakout with breaks above their downtrend lines as well. And uh, as you correctly noted, 4,300, a key psychological, but also important level for the market to surpass. We finally got past it with trade this week. So generally very positive. Um, I think the most positive thing is actually also that it's not just the biggest of the big stocks creating the breakout. It goes kind of gone without saying, but um, or gone unnoticed. Uh, but we all do see now nearly 60% of constituents in the S&P 500 trading above their 200-day moving average and small caps critically finally trading above their 50 and 200-day moving average as well. As we get a little of accumulation of strength in small caps, that should go a long way because, of course, that's been a huge drag on the market for, for most of the last two years. I feel like a lot of the critique, if you're you know, the, on the bear side, has been a lack of breadth support, a narrow yeah. leadership market. I feel like more and more the charts are not bearing out that reality, right? Or, or they certainly were before, but now you're starting to see quite a change, right? In term, particularly in terms of improving breadth. Yeah. And I also think, frankly, oftentimes you get these points in time where there's limited participation, but all, most of the time that limited participation is not actually a sell signal. It becomes a buy signal because it hints that, that the market mm -hmm. is in a consolidation phase, sort of strength is really concentrated, but ultimately that consolidation phase ends with greater participation, not less participation in a breakdown in those strong stocks. And I think that's what we're seeing over the course of this, um, this breakout here into June. Let's look underneath the hood of the market if we could a little bit. You have some proprietary indicators that you use to really try to understand the dynamics of the market. We're looking at your market pulse index. Can you describe what this is? What is it telling you about yeah. the conditions here? Yeah, so the market pulse index is our solution to sentiment. Uh, as a technician, I'm a firm believer that bottoms in the equity market are always made on sentiment. I'm a fundamental analyst as well, and I've never found that magic valuation level or magic earning signal that really creates a bottom in stocks, but sentiment is very consistently extremely poor at major lows. And so we developed this market pulse index where we went and tested hundreds of different market factors for their signals for the market. So I'm not looking at you know what people think or what they say or how they respond to a survey. I'm actually analyzing trends within the market that have historically been meaningful for driving changes in market character. And what we do with the Market Pulse Index is we take six different factors. We look at the performance of high volatility and compare it to performance of high, low volatility stocks. Likewise, we look at high leverage versus low leverage stocks performance. We look at defensive versus cyclical sector uh, focused stocks uh, performance. We look at changes in um, high yield spreads. We look at pairwise correlations and we look at breadth. And those six indicators as of the late September, early October lows in the market were so incredibly depressed. Uh, we were looking at sentiment levels based on those six indicators that were very similar to sentiment lows recorded back in the two, uh, 2016 low, recall February 2016, also the 2011 low after that major 20% correction affiliated with the European debt crisis and concerns about bond defaults here in the US, and then even back in the great financial crisis. So this was really consequential to framing our thought process for what we were to expect coming into 2023. After sentiment lows, stocks almost always do very, very well in the subsequent 12 months. Also, though, and importantly, by January, we had already made something of a manic peak. Hmm. So we had very rapidly recovered from October through January to a point where we were getting a manic signal on the, on the market pulse index at the end of January, guiding us to sort of back off a little bit on aggressiveness, take a little bit off the table, think about um, you know a, an easier climate, uh, a market that wasn't going to be quite so on fire <laughs> into the spring months. Now, luckily, that manic signal has since eased. By March, it was suggesting you know Goldilocks is here, sentiment is not too hot, not too cold, and we've been there through April and May, where sentiment's generally pretty supportive of conditions. 
It's not overwhelmingly depressed, but it's also not manic. Just just about right in the middle of the range there. Your next chart, uh, Gina, is talking about your market regime model. Talk to us about this one if you could. Yeah, this one's a little bit complicated, but nonetheless, what we do with this, and a lot of what we do at Bloomberg Intelligence really is just try to model the market. We're modeling mm. the market for what to expect. What kind of regime are we in is what this market, this market model works on. It says, what kind of returns can you expect given different indicators from the market itself? This again takes a subset of about six different indicators, but it takes those indicators and says, where are they relative to their long-term average? It clusters them through a process called agglomerative clustering. And it says what that, that group of six indicators, if I'm looking and observing where they are today in comparison to their long-term average, what periods of the past look like today? Mm. And what were the returns on the equity market that we could then that we then experienced after those periods in the past? So we look at things like growth in M2, which is a hot topic now because of the Fed. We look at realized volatility in the equity market. We look at breadth again. We look at changes in valuations, look at uh, um, corporate bond spreads and the like. And we say, what does it look like today? And can we find periods of the past that those things look similar? Lo and behold, this actually started to confirm a greater optimism, not optimistic tone for the broader, longer term outlook for stocks as of the spring. You'll note on the right hand side throughout 2022, it was very bearish. It was saying, look, conditions are pretty bad. The combination of those indicators looks like points in the past in which your forward 12 month returns were flattened down. So you wanted to be positioned very cautiously toward the US equity market, in particular toward large cap stocks. But as of this spring, it moved into a much more friendly condition. There's a tiny little yellow bar there on the right-hand side. And the yellow climate has historically been affiliated with long-term forward returns over the next 12 months, somewhere between four and eight. So as of the spring, this was confirming something that we had noticed in the sentiment index, which is a general, uh, generally more optimistic tone emerging in the broader regime for equity. It's amazing. It feels like the S&P getting above 4,300, just the latest step confirming some of these signals that you've seen, I guess, with the, the strength of the, of the conditions uh, underneath the hood of the market. Your last, uh, your last table here, a really interesting heat map called your sector scorecard. What does this tell us about leadership and opportunity in June of 2023? Yeah, yeah it's very cyclically positioned. So what we do with this scorecard, just briefly, is we rank all 11 sectors in the large cap index. We run a similar scorecard for small caps, European stocks, Chinese equities, you name it, we've probably got it. But this one's specific to the S&P 500. We relative rank all those sectors on the five columns to the right. So we look at price momentum, price breadth, earnings trend, revisions in earnings, as well as relative value. And we give each sector a score. That's the colored box. The green box is a great score. It's very strong price momentum, very strong price breadth for groups like communications, technology, industrials, and discretionary right now. Um, on the contrary, very, very negative relative value for some of those groups and negative price momentum and breadth for some of the more defensive groups. We then take those five scores and we aggregate them into an overall composite. The overall composite is very favorable right now for communications, technology, industrials, and discretionary stocks. This tells you where we're seeing opportunities, stronger opportunities emerging with a three to six month forward view. It also gives you a signal about the broader market. These are very cyclically oriented sectors. As you mentioned in your commentary earlier, you like to look at discretionary stocks relative to staple stocks. The scorecard is picking up on very similar trends. It's saying discretionary stocks better positioned than staple stocks. That's a pretty cyclical signal. Likewise, utilities is toward the bottom of the scorecard. Energy toward the bottom of the scorecard. What we learned last year, what was great for energy, not so great for the market. This year, what's bad for energy is working pretty well for the market. Mm. So I think you can get some broad market signals out of this, but also generally an allocation would point to some of the more cyclically oriented sectors as better positioned for performance over the next three to six. This is just a, a fantastic walk through a very well-defined process, Jeannie. We only have about a minute left, but I'd love to ask you about the Fed meeting coming up, of course, this okay. week. You know, we have a strong market. We have the S&P and the NASDAQ making new highs for the year. We have cyclical leadership, as your sector scorecard proves out. We're seeing improving breadth conditions. What are your expectations for the Fed this week? And what's the potential for that picture to change based on what we hear tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, so I think the Fed is going to go on pause. This is confirmed by our uh, Bloomberg economics team, thinks the Fed is going to pause this month. They think that they might hike again in July. 
I'm less convinced that we're going to see another hike. I think that the inflation numbers are dropping like a stone. So if you look at things like import prices, they're not falling year over year. Producer prices are getting close to that critical 3% level. Consumer prices we just got today running about 4% year over year. That's half the pace that they were running a year ago. So we're definitely seeing some improvement in inflation. That's been what the Fed's been focused so keenly on. And I do think that the Fed's on pause. We see this having driven some of the trade in equities this year. It's undeniable that the most interest rate sensitive in stocks in the S&P 500 have been those that have led. So those longer duration stocks with cash flows concentrated further into the future tend to perform better when interest rates are flat to down. And we have seen those stocks start to perform a bit better. I would expect a continuation of that as long as the Fed does go on pause. And a lot of the volatility that we've experienced in interest rates calms down and continues to calm as it has already this year. Gina, this was fantastic. What a pleasure to hear from you and uh, get your take on the uh, markets here. Be well, stay safe there in New York, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much for having me, and same to you. That's Gina Martin-Adams. Gina is the chief equity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence coming to us uh, from New York. That was a, that was a fantastic, that was a 10-minute masterclass on how to quantify the markets through technical disciplines using all sorts of different data. We were talking uh, before we went live, uh, talking about the different ways that we can model the markets and how it's, in a lot of ways, it's all technical. It's all looking at trends and momentum, just looking at different data sets to try to understand them a little better. I think a really good way of thinking of the uh, market environment, as always, from uh, Gina, Gina Martin-Adams at uh, Bloomberg Intelligence. We need to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes to tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. We're going with simplicity. We're going with the S&P 500, the daily chart. What I wanted to do is just go back to the 2022 high. As I was thinking of Gina's appearance, looking at some of the, the charts and themes she was talking about, just caused me to take a step back from the chart of the S&P and think of this rotation that we've experienced. I think the break above 4,300 is meaningful. I think that follow through above 4,200, above 4,300, bullish markets overcome resistance levels. And that's what we're seeing so far. So it's becoming less and less easy to be bearish in the face of strong evidence to the contrary. But I think one of the great takeaways from the daily chart of the S&P is the break above a trend line. Think of 2022 as a big town downtrend channel. We make a higher low, we break above that trend line, and from there we've continued on. Reminds me to keep the process simple and focus on the big picture. Now, what at some point the market will stop going up. That is a guarantee uh, from a seasoned technical analyst. So what would tell me that that might happen? I'm looking at the RSI being overbought, which may be an early warning that we have to uh, take a pause at some point. I'm also looking at the PPO, which are the MACD, which has not given a sell signal yet, but would often confirm that a top has indeed occurred. Chart number two, the material sector, strongest sector today. I think what's interesting about the chart of the XLB is this in, or sorry, this head and shoulders top that never really was confirmed. A lot of people mentioned this head and shoulders top, the peak in February, the lower high in December, the lower high in April. You take a trend line connecting the lows between those highs. That's called the neckline of the pattern. The pattern's initiated as a top if and when you break down through the neckline. That never happened. We ended up finding support at 75, and now we're rotating higher. This is a chart in more of a bullish position with the momentum improving, which may be a key thing to watch. Finally, in a market that is going higher, I'm always watching for double topping patterns, for divergences, for bearish candle patterns, something that might suggest that we may rotate a lower. Some early warning that things might have gotten overheated. I'm looking at the chart of AMD, which has now potentially made a double top around 130. Look at the high from the end of May. Look at what happened this week. This is called a bearish engulfing pattern. We have an up day and then a down day, and the second day engulfs the range of the first day. Now, that's just a short-term sell signal. That tells you the short-term conditions are negative. Keep an eye on this to see if it follows through. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Special thank you to Gina Martin-Adams of Bloomberg joining us from New York. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night.